Senator Sanders earlier this evening uh, said he's in favor of felons being able to vote, uh, even while serving their prison terms. He was asked specifically about people like the Boston Marathon bomber, uh, people convicted of sexual assault, uh, rape and other things, pedophiles. What do you think? Should people convicted of sexual assault of the Boston Marathon bomber, should they be able to vote? While incarcerated? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Uh, I. <laughs> I do believe that when you are out, when you have served your sentence, then uh, part of being restored to society is that you are part of the political life of this nation again. And one of the things that needs to be restored is your right to vote. But, but part of the punishment when you, were, uh, when you were convicted of a crime and you're incarcerated is you lo lose certain rights, you lose your freedom. Uh, and I think during that period, uh, it does not make sense to, to have an exception for the right to vote. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network. This is our weekly segment on trending topics where we discuss some of the significant news items from the past week. One of those big issues was the CNN town hall and the question of voting rights for the incarcerated. And of course, Senator Joe Biden has finally announced that he's running for the Democratic nomination for president. Here to talk about these issues with me this week are Norman Solomon. Norman is the national coordinator for RootsAction.org. And Anoa Changa. Anoa is an attorney and a director of political advocacy for Progressive Army. She's also the host of the highly recommended podcast, The Way with Anoa. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thanks. All right, let's start. Let's jump right in with this CNN town hall this week. Because a lot of talk is centered around Bernie Sanders wanting the Boston bomber and rapist to vote like this subhead in the a New York Times recap of the town hall says. Uh, it reads that Sanders backs voting rights for Boston bombers, uh, for the Boston bomber and rapists. But what Sanders really said was uh, this. I think we have the clip from what Sanders said at the town hall. I think the right to vote is inherent to our democracy. Yes, even for terrible people. Because once you start chipping away and you say, well, that guy committed a terrible crime, not going to let him vote. Or well, that person did that, not going to let that person vote. You're running down a slippery slope. So I believe that people who commit crimes, they pay the price. When they got out of jail, I believe they certainly should have the right to vote. But I do believe that even if they are in jail, they're paying their price to society, but that should not take away their inherent American right to participate in our democracy. Applause for the answer. My follow question goes to this being like you're writing an opposition ad against you by saying you think the Boston Marathon bomber should vote not after he pays his debt to society, but while he's in jail. You sure about that? Look, <laughs> you know, this is what I believe. Do you believe in democracy? Do you believe that every single American 18 years of age or older who's an American citizen has the right to vote? Once you start chipping away at that, believe me, that's what our Republican governors all over this country are doing. They come up with all kinds of excuses why people of color, young people, poor people can't vote. And I will do everything I can to resist it. You got to love Sanders' enthusiasm uh, when he responds to this question. And I want to start with you, Anoa, and ask you specifically about the role the media played in the way this question mm -hmm. was framed. Mm -hmm. Like, what's, mm -hmm. your, what's your take on how CNN framed this question and how it played out for Sanders and Pete Buttigieg? Well, I will say, like, if the question is like other questions for other town halls, the student who asked it is, is more than likely wrote it. They may have helped tweak it some, but that came from that person. But I think your question about how has the media helped uh, frame it, you know, before this town hall, Bernie Sanders did actually come out and say he did believe that incarcerated persons should vote, which I believe is probably what, what, what prompted the question to begin with. But, but part of the problem with the spin has been, they stuck with the problematic framing in the actual question, right? As very extreme examples provided. Um, even you see Lindsey Graham, like, oh my God, that means he thinks Dylan Roof, who murdered XYZ people and XYZ occurrence should get to vote, like trying to inflame rhetoric. And we know that this is an industry that's heavily driven by clicks, 
by headlines. I mean, most 60% of Americans do not read past the headline uh, in most art, in most instances. So it is driving a particular narrative. But when you really dig deep and you start looking at, and you see most of the major civil rights organizations, uh, legal organizations pushing back, also saying like, duh, this is a no brainer. Bernie Sanders is right because voter suppression of any form should not be tolerated. We should not be writing caveats into, you know, really what is one of the most fundamental rights that we should be protecting. And as in many states, we see that the right to vote has actually been severely eroded in many occurrences. Now, when we're talking about incarcerated persons, you know, incarcerated persons are good enough to go fight fires for pennies on the dollar. They're good enough to be counted uh, for actual congressional, you know, when we draw congressional districts, they are counted as part of that population, but they're denied the act the opportunity to vote and participate. One thing that I always thought was really great from last cycle was Rachel Rollins, who's now um, DA is self accounting, which is around Boston. Uh, they actually, in their DA, their primary race, there was actually a form a forum that was held with incarcerated persons in in in, in the county, um, asking questions of, of the DA candidates and what they would do, you know, on criminal justice reforms, et cetera. And I think being able to have those people participating in the process and not being shut out because we see just with the re-enfranchisement of voters in Florida, how Republicans, but it's not always only just Republicans in Florida instances, predominantly Republican led to just to, to, to create an extra hurdle to the amendment that overwhelmingly passed, you know, with support of Floridians. Um, we see now they're trying to put these other barriers in what basically amounts to a poll tax. So there are all these very nuanced aspects to this very basic idea that Bernie Sanders is discussing which the lack of nuance sometimes with him is one of my cr major critiques of the way he communicates ideas and issues. And I just felt that instead of accepting her problematic uh, extreme framing, which is what everyone ran with in headlines, it could have been flipped on his head. But I thought over overall, he's absolutely right on about this, this, this whole premise that when we start eroding and deciding and picking and choosing who is valuable and who can vote and who cannot, we start to create a slippery slope we already see that happening in many states across the country. That, I mean, you raised a lot of great issues, but I think the one that stuck out to me the most was that the, the statistic that 60% of, of Americans don't read Pete past the headline. So what we get from the media is driven by clicks, uh, is driven by sensationalism, and there is this nuance that is very, very important in this discussion that, that Sanders seems to have done a good job with, he mm -hmm. also seems to have had a better uh, reception at the Fox News town hall with explaining Medicare for all that he did here. Um, and, and even some on the left have come out against him on this issue uh, from this town hall. But there's also been pushback against CNN for this framing, uh, mm -hmm. like this tweet from uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in her response. Um, but... Norman, I, I want to ask you, when we're talking about the framing of this discussion and, and the fact that incarcerated people were not included in this discussion in the town hall, that this was an audience of students uh, from, uh, from a, a local college, I believe, um, is this really an issue of, of, as the New York Times framed it, giving terrorists and rapists the right to vote? Or is this a bigger problem with uh, corporate influence in the media that we need to pay attention to? A lot of the problem with corporate media is continuing to depict some people as the other, prisoners among them, more generally and more subtly often just people of color or people, those who don't have a lot of power in the society. And if we're going to look at this particular instance, it's not just CNN and cable news. As you noted, the New York Times took the most retrograde, opportunistic, and slanderous way to frame Bernie Sanders' response. And what I think we need to look at very strongly and very clearly is that this issue is the Willie Horton issue so far of this presidential campaign. As in 1988, the racist ad against Michael Dukakis by the uh, George Herbert Walker Bush forces were also playing on racism and the, the fear of prisoners and uh, trying to exploit some of the most uh, racist tropes uh, that have been in place uh, for centuries in this country. And frankly, I'm outraged that the New York Times and other media outlets 
would take a principled position by Bernie Sanders against voter suppression and turn it around and try to uh, exploit uh, the most uh, uh, extreme interpretations of what he said to make this Willie Horton uh, 2019. And so I just think we have to push back on this and recognize that this is part of a propaganda assault. This is uh, some really great uh, uh, comparisons. These were some great comparisons you made, Norman, about uh, the, the, the uh, similarities to the Willie Horton campaign and, and the Dukakis campaign. This is uh, uh, journalistic history or campaign, campaign and political history that we need to be reminded of uh, when we're looking at the role of corporate media in our politics today. Um, Oh, Noah, let me give you the last word on this. What role does independent media play in, in this campaign cycle? Is it a bigger role than last time? Uh, what, what, what role does independent media play uh, in, in these types I of issues? Well, I appreciate that. And I mean, this is how we came to, we, we first crossed paths, right? Um, I think that in this cycle, just as we saw a past cycle, there is a really high burden, um, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, because it's the value proposition that we often say that we have as progressive independent media um, folks that we're trying to parse through the BS and really get good commentary and get straight to the issues and inform people of what's going on. So I do think that we do have the standard to really actually effectively discuss these issues to help raise the voices of doing people, people who are doing directly the work and, and, and get people actual information. You know, I don't remember who shared it, but someone shared a report from the Sentencing Project. Like the Sentencing Project has been talking about um, you know, incarcerated persons voting while incarcerated for like probably almost two decades. I think I, I think I saw something that was actually dated 1999, right? So this is not a new thing that Bernie Sanders just thought of. This is something that's been well thought of and discussed by a lot of people. And when you look at the continuing conditions, those who are incarcerated here, and, and we focus so much on the federal prison system or private prisons, but the majority of people who are in prison in this country are in state and local holding, right? And, and the conditions that people are, are, are in, you know, just the recent accounts from uh, Fulton County and DeKalb County jails down here in Georgia, I mean, are appalling. And, and we're seeing issues of strikes, of starvation, of people having issues with being exposed to mold, all types of stuff. I remember real quickly during the 2014 West Virginia water crisis in Charleston, West Virginia, prisoners were being given the equivalent or incarcerated prisoners were being given the equivalent of, I think it was one, like, one bottle of water per day. And this was a time where as a, as a community, as a countywide area, we were on a 10 day water ban. So no water for anything, they were being given one bottle. So when we're saying that we're, we're, we're not allowing people to participate civically in what is happening, we're saying that they don't, well, we as in the people who are saying this, saying that these people are not people, they're second class citizens, they don't count as much as we do. And that's a problem. And then when we, again, when like, like Bernie Sanders has said, when we start creating special classes of people, as we've already seen people talk about going back to a different era, that's exactly what the type of rhetoric we're hearing from people is actually enforcing and supporting. And we already have a steep climb um, to, to getting people re-enfranchised who've already been disenfranchised from the system. So so, so these barriers that are that are kept up are problematic. And I think independent media has a real serious uh, burden on us. And, and really, th th it, it should be our welcomed burden, right, to make sure that we're upholding, you know, good conversations, as truthful commentary as possible, and really digging deep and doing critical analysis, even if it means, you know, calling our faves on the carpet. And, you know, we've certainly done plenty of that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining me today on this segment. Unfortunately, we are out of time on this segment. But uh, Norman, Anoa, stick around for the next segment where we will talk about Joe Biden's announcement. And thank you all for watching this segment of Trending News on the Real News Network. I am Jacqueline Lukeman.